Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and, well, let me ask you a question. Is there any way for us to predict an actual volcanic eruption before it occurs? As of a few years ago, the answer has actually been no. There are obviously signs of a potential eruption, such as a lot of tremors, a lot of unusual activity on the surface, and obviously the history of previous eruptions, but in general there is no actual technique for us to currently predict volcanic eruptions as they are about to occur. But that's until relatively recently. Today we're going to be discussing this new study and this new paper that was published not so long ago that suggests an extremely brilliant technique that uses something that comes from outer space, specifically cosmic rays, to actually predict volcanic eruptions with extreme accuracy. Something that in theory, in the next few years, can actually completely eliminate any fatalities from potential eruptions. And so in this video, let's discuss exactly what this technique is, what muons are, and how this is going to help us in the future. But first of all, as always, all of the links and the study itself are of course in the description below. So muography, although I guess another way of calling this would be muonography. I'm not sure which I like more. A few years ago, a paper published in the Nature magazine revealed something completely mind-blowing for the archaeologists studying Egyptian pyramids, specifically the Great Pyramids. They found a hidden chamber, something that was not known to exist until 2017. And this right here was the first official success of the technique now referred to as muography. The scientists here used something coming from outer space, cosmic rays, to actually scan the pyramids and discover a tiny hidden chamber that nobody knew was there to begin with. You can find this paper in the description below as well. And as the name implies, this technique uses something known as muons. Now today, most people have no idea what muons are. Kind of like back in the days, nobody knew what electrons are, but today we're quite familiar with what electrons represent and how they help our society through, for example, the production of electricity. Electrons are really important to us, and one day muons might be as well. And interestingly, muons are, well, technically they're like cousins of electrons. Just like electrons, they're considered to be subatomic particles. But unlike electrons, they have an extremely heavy mass. They actually are approximately 207 times heavier than a typical electron, even though every other property is pretty much the same. But compared to other subatomic particles, they also have a generally long lifetime. They can last for approximately 2.2 microseconds. This is way longer than anything else. Which means that after their creation, they generally have some time to influence some of the matter around them before essentially disintegrating into other subatomic particles. But because they're massive particles, a lot more massive than electrons, they can also generally penetrate into matter much easier. And in this case, what this means is that they only experience a lot of deceleration and can usually get through, for example, a mountain without really feeling anything. And because of this ability to penetrate matter and to go through very, very thick layers of Earth, and also because their general lifetime is somewhat long compared to some other particles, in theory, they could be used to scan various objects. Which is kind of similar to how we use X-rays today to scan people's bodies. But there are other properties that make them interesting. For example, in a typical radioactive material, you're not actually going to find any muons coming out of anywhere. So, in other words, we're not going to be detecting this coming from inside planet Earth. The only muons we can detect on planet Earth usually have either one of two sources. Either some sort of a particle accelerator that usually accelerates matter to extremely fast velocities and allows these particles to collide producing muons, or from cosmic radiation and specifically from cosmic particles that collide with upper atmosphere and produce a lot of secondary particles. Which in essence sort of looks like this, an extremely fast moving proton, which is usually produced somewhere really far away, for example a distant black hole or even some sort of a really powerful supernova, will hit the upper atmosphere which would then produce a lot of these secondary particles, a lot of pions, a lot of muons and anti-muons, and a lot of other stuff as well. And many of these muons are going to survive for approximately 2.2 microseconds. As a matter of fact, many of them currently are literally doing this to my head. They're going through my head and, well, I can't really feel anything, but I know they're there. Actually, in reality, it's even faster than this. It's approximately a thousand per second. But once their lifetime expires, after approximately 2.2 microseconds, that's when they disappear and become other particles. 
Oh, and by the way, don't worry about this. They don't actually interact with meta very well and are generally pretty harmless, so there's really nothing to worry about. But we know that they do actually penetrate everything. And because of their mass, they can also easily penetrate a lot of different types of surfaces and, of course, rock and volcanoes and pyramids. But their overall decay rate really sort of depends on the density of the object. The denser the material, the more likely they're going to decay faster, and thus, on the other side, you're going to be detecting a lot less of them. So in other words, just like the X-rays, you can use muons to hypothetically scan various objects, assuming that you're standing on the other side. And so that's the basic principle of this recent paper. The scientists were using muons, and specifically using muons passing through volcanoes, to try to see what's going on on the inside and to try to predict various volcanic eruptions. And the principle here is relatively simple to understand. Generally, inside the volcano, before it erupts, it's going to be accumulating a lot of magma that's going to be pressurizing more and more. And all of this collects right beneath the cone. And so if we could somehow look inside the volcano and see all of this accumulation, we could obviously, in theory, predict the moment before the eruption, possibly a few days before the eruption, possibly even a few weeks. Which is, of course, more than enough time for the people in the region to evacuate until the eruption is finished. One of the volcanoes they focused on in this paper is this Japanese volcano located in the south of Japan, known as Sakurajima. The volcano known for several deadly eruptions that even today poses quite a lot of danger to people living in the region. Here's actually the eruption from 2013, and as you can see, this is a really, really powerful volcano. And so for their study, the scientists essentially focused on the cross-section of the volcano, investigating several areas underneath one of the craters. And during their survey, they started to discover patterns that were quite visible in several images, the patterns suggesting the motion and the movement of magma underneath. In this case, the scientists referred to this particular graph as a time-sequential myographic map. And as you can probably imagine, their analysis was very positive. The actual myographs showed or predicted the eruptions before they occurred. Although in this case, we're only talking about a few hours before the actual eruption. But this would still give people enough time to evacuate if this was a really, really massive eruption. And all of this was of course done simply by measuring the amount of muons passing through the volcano and through the magma flowing through various chambers inside. And remember, the idea here is that if there is something inside the volcano like magma, the muons are just going to get stuck and you're not going to see anything coming out. Whereas if you detect a lot of muons coming from the other side, it means that there is really nothing and the volcano is probably empty. But I guess the question is, okay, but where do you place the muon detectors? And also generally these are actually kind of bulky. Well, the scientists were able to figure all of this out by first of all placing some of these detectors very close to the edge of the volcano itself, but more importantly, they were able to miniaturize it and put it on a helicopter and flying extremely close to the volcano's flanks. You can sort of see the region where they were located, and essentially the helicopter just kind of hovers here, collecting all of the muon data. But obviously, the miniaturized versions would not produce a very high-quality image. The bigger the detector, the better the image. So at the moment, this technique is still in its infancy. And at the same time, just one detector only produces a two-dimensional picture. To get a more three-dimensional perspective of what happens on the inside, you would have to do this from several different sides and most likely use at least three different detectors. So there's obviously still quite a lot of work to be done and quite a lot of things to discover. And as of today, they've tried this technique around several volcanoes with quite a lot of success. So these squares in blue right here show you the volcanoes where this was tried. As you can see, the Philippines, Japan, some of the volcanoes in Italy, including the famous Vesuvius, and at least one volcano in the Caribbean, the one in Guadalupe. And as you can imagine, all of this was so far very successful. Which makes this an extremely interesting technique and something that the scientists might be using in the future to scan a lot of other things on planet Earth. Or not just Earth, possibly even other planets and even our moon. This right here shows us the moon as seen by an observatory that was able to detect the reflection by the cosmic rays coming from the surface of the moon itself. And so in theory, it should be possible to use this technique to maybe even detect some other things around the solar system. Although naturally, because of the relatively short lifetime of a typical muon, this would have its limitations. 
And so a super interesting technique, and something that I think in a few decades is going to be commonplace as well. Chances are, just like electrons became popular a few decades ago, or I guess more like 100 years ago, muons are going to be commonplace as well. We just don't have much use for them just yet. Anyway, on that note, check out all of the relevant links in the description below, subscribe if you still haven't, and share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences. Maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else, maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Either way, stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.